Well, welcome to the third session where we're talking about the story of Doxadeo. And uh, we've reflected on some of the principles coming from Mark chapter 6, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, the first one being changing our mentality, the difference between the disciples, Jesus, moving from concern to compassion. And secondly, the need for strategy. The understanding that Jesus broke the group up into fifties and hundreds, it was something of a strategic posturing for the miraculous to happen. We had this wonderful journey in Doxadeo, launched then in 1996, and uh, had these two principles guiding us in terms of our engagement. And in 1999, there was an event called in Singapore by a man called Peter Wagner. Now, at that stage, Peter Wagner was one of the recognized, real senior generals within the context of the global church. And Peter decided that he was going to invite about 40 leaders from different places in the world to consider what is God saying to the church for the new millennium. You will remember that the year 2000 was a bit of a challenge for many people, thinking that everything was going to come to an end. Uh, the millennial bug was going to hit and it was going to be over. And so we somehow made the list to represent South Africa at that particular event. I remember very distinctly how I read the names. It was the who's who globally on this list. And there was my name. And I submitted this to the leadership team of Doxadeo. And their thought was, well, when you invite people, you invite senior people and you always have to invite a few junior people so that somebody can carry the tea around and give the people the cookies. So it was with that mandate that they sent me and Liana to go to Singapore. It was an incredible event. You can imagine sitting in this room, listening to these men and women of God that were giving oversight to incredible ministries. Ministries that were planting churches in the thousands. At that stage, we had just started our fourth campus. And so here I am sitting in this group saying to Liana, I feel extremely intimidated. These guys are giving oversight to thousands of churches. And if they have to find out, we're only in one city and we only have four campuses. You know, that would be a very intimidating moment. So in the second day, as this time progresses, uh, in the afternoon, there is this moment where uh, a time of ministry breaks out. And these men and women of God are starting to pray for one another, prophesy over one another. And literally because Liana and I felt that we did not have the standing with this group, we went and stood against the wall and reached out our hands and we were just praying for everybody. And in that moment, Peter Wagner comes to me and he takes me by the arm and he leads me into the middle of the group and he says, God has a word for you. So here I'm standing in the midst of this group, and they start forming around us, and two of the very significant prophetic ministries of that time, Bill Hammond and Chuck Pierce, come stand right in front of us, and they start prophesying. Liana so excited, she takes out a camera and starts taking photos. I'm thinking to myself, my wife, this is such a spiritual moment. Now you're taking photos. I mean, it's Later, I was so grateful because that particular moment became one of the guiding lights in our journey. 
Here I was standing, thinking, well, Lord, these guys don't know me from a bar of soap. They don't know who I am. And so they're starting to prophesy. At that stage, you've got to understand, we were so committed to Pretoria. I believe that God had a plan with this city and that this was the royal city every October. It turns purple. It's God's hand on the city. It's, it's like this is the place where God wants to establish his rule. And so this guy starts prophesying. The next moment, he puts his finger under my nose. And he says, God says, he's not just giving you one city. He's giving you 12. So I'm shocked. Really shocked because now everybody knows we're just in one city. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, we walk out there and Liana asks me, she says, so what do you say about that? And being the spiritual giant that I am, I say, I think these guys had too much pizza last night. <laughs> Why would I want to look at 12 cities? I mean, one city is a life mission. Why would we want to engage with 12 cities? Anyway, I came back and took out a map of South Africa, rolled it open and tried to find 12 significant cities. Couldn't quite find that. Rolled the map back, put it away, and said, you know what? We're just going to keep doing what we're doing. So two years later, in 2002, we're having a series in Doxadeo where we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Some of you might recall we spoke about the four elements of the Holy Spirit being wind and fire and water and and whatever the other one was. And anyway, we, we were in the wind part of it. And we challenged people and said, go back and reflect on what God has spoken in your life. Because God speaks to us and, and there is a time when God wants to reveal that purpose in your life. And so because we were challenging the church to do that, we as a leadership were challenging ourselves to spend a lot of time just reading again Mark chapter 6. And one day while we're reading Mark chapter 6, we get to the portion and they picked up 12 baskets. And when we read it, it was like an electric shock that went through us and we heard God say to us, it's time for export. Well, we were overwhelmed because we had so committed to one city that we thought, you know, how could we, how could we in any way rearrange this narrative to 12 cities? But you know, there's something about a progression in the journey with God. God takes you on this journey and God wanted to get our attention. Actually, I felt really bad because suddenly I realized that for two years God had been trying to get our attention. Well, we submitted that to the leadership, to the church. We started praying about it. What does this mean? And in a very short space of time, we sensed that God was challenging us to start branching out to other cities and two cities that immediately came to us, and this is what we committed to. We said, we don't want to go and find cities. We want the cities to find us. Literally, we want a Macedonian call. It must, it must be a city that puts a demand on us. We're not just going to roll open the map and try and find cities. We, we want to know that this is God. And at that stage, Cape Town was, was very evident that there was a demand that was put on us to engage. And also at that stage, we had so many of our people that were in London. It was that time when they had the two-year visa option, and there were so many of our people in London, and they were screaming, would you come and put a doxodeo in London? And so we opened up the conversation in these two cities, and they became our first two cities of engagement. And subsequent to that, as you know, we, we started to engage in other cities as they put a demand on us. 
going to Oslo, Norway as our 10th city. At this stage, we see that there is some demand coming from Australia. There's some demand coming from the United States. And we know in our hearts that that we can trust God that by the end of 2020, we will know which of those 12 cities we are to be engaged in. So the 12 baskets became the third driving reality. Many people ask me the question, so Alan, once we're in the 12 cities, what happens then? Well, God will speak, and we are at peace. We know that when we get there, God will take us to the next step. Because the fourth principle that we learned in this journey was this principle of breaking small pieces. You know what's amazing when we look at the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000? When Jesus says to the disciples, go break this group into groups of fifties and hundreds, they do that. And then they come back and Jesus takes this little boy's lunch and he takes the bread and the fish and he blesses it and he breaks it. But Jesus doesn't go and break the bread and the fish and build a whole reserve, you know, a whole pile of bread and a whole pile of fish so that the disciples can feel very secure. You know, at least now we have the reserve, you know, reserve now matches need. So we're good. We're going to be able to feed these people. He doesn't. He takes the bread and the fish. And he breaks it, and he puts it into the hands of the disciples. And then he looks at the disciples and he says, guys, go feed the people. Now I can just see those disciples. (laughs) I mean, this is a, this is, I mean, this is not helpful. Can you feel the tension of that moment? Because this is what we learned. This is the tension we live in. Even as a ministry, everything that we've started, everything that we've done, we've never had the resources up front. We've never had all the money. We've never had all the people. We've never had all the things that are. We've just had what God had put in our hands, and we had the word of the Lord saying, Go and feed. And so here the disciples are. I see this disciple. Now the rabbi has said, We better do this. So so here we go. I see him walking down to a group of 100 and then deciding, Let's rather start with a group of 50. And then I see him breaking that first piece. I guarantee you, the first piece was a small piece. Why? He's a smart disciple. This stuff's got to last. I mean, so he breaks the first piece and he gives it to him. And I mean, can you imagine the person that got the first piece? I can just, I can just see that. So this is it. You guys went to all this trouble for this? And I see him trying to explain. I'm so sorry. And then and then he breaks another piece. Also a small piece, sorry, another piece. And as he's breaking the pieces, he recognizes something miraculous is in my hand. And and I see him just testing it, breaking a little bit of a bigger piece. (laughs) Breaks a bigger piece. And then another piece. And then another. Hey, 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 help yourselves. I see him just breaking pieces. Why? Because they ate so much and had 12 baskets left over. Here's what happened. They started breaking the pieces. And this was the principle that God taught us. 
When I speak, I want you to start. Even if you don't see all the resources, even if you don't, if you can't convince everybody about everything being okay that this is going to work, but make sure that you've heard the voice of God. And then start breaking the pieces. You know, one of these stories that we have of, of breaking pieces is um, years ago here in, in, in this campus as we started, uh, we were convinced that God was calling us to the city. Now today it's a little different when you think about you know, Pretoria and you see we have 14 campuses. As a matter of fact, you can't travel further than five kilometers in this city without running into some expression of Doxadeo in the city. It's either a school or an orphanage or a skills training program or a church. There is now a saturation within the context of the city. But you've got to understand in the early years when we said city, it was like, Huge. And so there were f a few police guys in the church that I was driving them crazy talking about the city and the city and the city. So they came to me and they said, Alan, you're always talking about the city. Do you know how bad the city really is? I said, no, well, educate me. They said, we'd love to. Would you come to Sunnyside Police Station Friday night, 12 o'clock? We'll take you on a tour. I said, that sounds like fun. I'm going to bring a few people. And so... We rounded up a few leaders, and so we're there Friday night, and they give us this little lecture about all the bad things happening in the city, and they load us up in a van, and they start taking us to all the bad places in the city. I mean, some of the really bad nightclub areas. The bad thing was I walked into one, and a guy said to me, Pastor, what are you doing here? <laughs> uh, I said, I'll see you in church on Sunday. Anyway, I, I, as we were driving through the streets of Pretoria, I saw literally hundreds of people lying in the streets on cardboard and on newspapers. And so I, I, I asked the policeman, I said, what are these people doing here? He said, they sleep here. And kind of with an attitude in my heart, I said, why do you allow it? And then he made a statement that rocked my world. He said, because they have nowhere else to go. I thought, this is impossible. In my city, I didn't know, I did not know that there were people sleeping on the streets in the inner city of Pretoria. I, I stayed out here on the, in the leafy suburbs. I, I don't go downtown 12 o'clock on a Friday night. I have no idea what's happening there. And so this really disturbed me and it, it arrested my heart. And so I came back here the next Sunday. The church knew that I was going on this excursion, so I was going to give feedback. And I, and I shared with them my experience that, that I was more arrested by the pain of the city than the sin of the city. And I preached about, could we make a difference? And I, I preached a good sermon. <laughs> well, it must have been a good sermon because two days later, somebody arrives here, comes to my office, and he has two of these homeless people. And he says, so Alan, what do we do now? <laughs> I, I look at him and I say, well, what do you mean? Why, why, why did you bring them here? He said, but you told us we must make a difference. I said, yeah, sure, I told you, but I didn't think you were going to bring them to me. <laughs> and then I realized how easy it is to talk about it, to even preach about it, to even pray about it, but it's challenging to do something about it. And so I realized God is setting us up, and I said, you know what? We're going to do something. We're going to find a place for them. Let's arrange something. So we start arranging something. Then the rumor spreads in the congregation that people are being helped, and, and more people are bringing people, and I'm trying to stop this. Saying, guys, guys, you misunderstood me. This is not, this is not quite what I had in mind. And, and then I realized we better find a place. And so Karl Buerta was, was, was uh, mandated to go and find us a place. And it was, a, it was a long story, but we found a building, 
a derelict, old, dilapidated building, a beautiful building, older than the Union buildings, but on the wrong side of the, of the train tracks, in an area where very few people wanted to go. Salvacorp. Three-story building. Had no electricity. Everything in it was, was just done. They wanted to demolish the building. We contracted with the owners and said, could we rent this building? Excited, we came back to the church and said, guys, we found a building. It's in Salvoco, but it's a wonderful building. Would you come and help us and fix this building? And, and we found a few brave people and they started helping us fix the building. And then we started loading this building up with people and, and, and literally three stories. We, we, were, we concentrated about, I don't know how many hundred people into that, that building. And then we realized we've just made the biggest mistake of our lives. We have just concentrated the problems of the city into one building and it now belongs to us. <laughs> we have no idea what we've done. Because we didn't understand that world. You know, it was, it was just weird. We were learning so fast. I mean, the drug dealers were delighted. They didn't even have to go and find the people. They just checked in every evening and sold the drugs under our noses. And, and we started realizing, we've got to fix this. We can't do this. We better skill these people. We better get these people to, to get back into society. And, and so we didn't know what to do, but we started a, a recycling business. We said to all the people, bring your trash. We'll, we'll recycle it. It was terrible. It stank. It was a disaster. But we sold some of the recycling stuff trying to get people to become economically active. Then realized, we better, we better equip these people. We better start with some skills training. Then we started skills training. And as this progressed, today Pop-Up is the premier skills training institution in this whole region, training more than a thousand people in 18 different skills in various sites, now rolling out to other cities. We're, we're so grateful for what's happening. We are placing 70% of those people back into mainstream economy, giving them jobs, starting entrepreneurial engagement. And here's the best of it all. 70% of those people write a testimony first time in their lives to say, I have given my life to Jesus Christ. It's become an outreach to the city. Did we know how to do this? Did we understand skills training? Did we understand? No. But we just started breaking the pieces. And this has been our journey. And so as we've navigated this journey, we've said, Lord, would you entrust more to us? Would you, would you allow us to grow? And, and, and as we, we put our foot on the water in different spaces, whether it be social society, engaging the pain and the brokenness of our communities. Whether it be the arts, or media, or business, or government. We want to start breaking the pieces. And as we've done this, we've seen how God has entrusted us with more. You know, just recently, we've had some people in the USA ask us whether we would relocate the Doxadeo Global Office in their area, in Fort Lauderdale. And they would fund it, and they would pay for it, for us to be able to do that. And so, Liana and I, together with Anton and Bernice Fenter, relocated our lives into that space. And these people asked us one question. They said, we've watched what God has done through you in the context of Pretoria and other cities. Would you help us to do this here in Fort Lauderdale? We didn't know where to start. We didn't know how to go about that because we had no relational equity in that region. We said, Lord, we're just going to start breaking small pieces. You know, if I reflect back now, we've been in and out that process for the last three years. God has put together something that is so unique, so incredible. We have more, we have a few hundred churches now engaged in a unity movement where they are now aligning themselves to trust God together 
to change the lostness, the pain, and the brokenness of that region. This ministry at the south point of Africa, affecting one of the key gateway regions of the world, because now from Miami all the way to West Palm Beach, leaders are coming together saying, help us to better understand how to engage our world. And sometimes I sit there and I say, Lord, I'm blown away. How could you take a young boy that's, that grew up in Heidelberg in South Africa and put him here among the Americans and they are drinking and asking help us to design the processes going forward. Folks, you're part of something that is incredible. We've started breaking pieces, but this is becoming big pieces, and we're breaking them all over the world. And all over the world, we see how people are gravitating to take hold of this very same vision. You're part not just of your campus, your little community, you're part of a global process where God is doing amazing things. And if that excites you, would you give God a great hand? <laughs>